Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you here this afternoon on the Friday before the holiday, so thank you for being here. I'm Catherine Hall Bethel. I'm an associate dean in the graduate school, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the seventh annual 3MT competition at UNC Charlotte. Um, I'm glad that you're able to be here today. I know our participants appreciate your support. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about the 3MT competition. The first 3MT was held at the University of Queensland in Australia in uh, 2008. And we had 160 research students competing. After that, the following year, they advertised the competition throughout Australia and New Zealand. It became very popular. And by 2011, it, it, it had gone international. They now have 3MT competitions at over 350 universities in 18 different countries. So it's a, quite a popular event. And the winner of our competition today will go on to compete regionally. Now because a lot of research is publicly funded, it's really important for scientists to understand how to convey the importance of their work very clearly to a non-specialist audience. And that's what the 3MT competition helps them do. So today, in under three minutes, they will explain their research to you using one static slide and no props. Um, and if they do it successfully, I'm sure you'll recognize them today. Um, the competition really does showcase some of the excellent research being done by our students. And today we're really glad to have partners here to share it with you because as the Urban Research University in Charlotte, we think it's really important that people know more about the kind of work our students do here at the university. So I hope you enjoy the presentations today. Um, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jill Berta, who's the Executive Director of the Center for Graduate Life and Learning. And Jill will introduce our judges. Hello everyone, welcome. It's great to see you here. Um, as Dr. Paul Hertel just pointed out, the point of this competition is to be able for our graduate students to learn to uh, distill their research into something they can convey to people who are not in their fields. And because of that, we always recruit a panel of judges from the community who do just that on a regular basis. People who have others report to them with all kinds of data and statistics and research and technical information and use that to make decisions. And that's what makes our judging panel today so such a perfect fit for this competition. So I'd like to introduce you all. Uh, we have Susan Clifford, who is an HR leadership partner at Equitable. Preserves 
and protects waters um, of the Catawba River. Um, so thank you, judges. We know it's a busy end of the week, and we're so thrilled you're spending some time seeing what our students have been up to in their research. I have many thank yous to make, so uh, I, will, I will do it quickly. I want to thank the people who provided one-on-one -on -one coaching to the finalists that you'll see today. So that includes Catherine Paul Pintel, Elise Demeter, Ari Young, Laura Smales, Suzanne Boyd, Daryl Kerr, and Judith Krauss. So we appreciate their effort. We had 20 or so UNC Charlotte staff who served as judges in the preliminary round. So I won't name them all, but, but thank you to all of you. And a special thank you to Saraksha Rajpal, sitting in the front, who has put in an enormous effort to make this all go smoothly and to organize us and our competitors. <laughs> um, okay, word about the rules. I'm talking to you, competitors. <laughs> As you recall, you have three minutes or less to describe your research to a non-specialist audience. You may use one static slide, no animations, no sound effects, no fancy effects whatsoever. Just you, three minutes, and a slide. Um, here's how the timing process will work. It will be just like the preliminary rounds. So when you have 30 seconds left in your presentation, Suraksha will hold up that yellow card. So we won't interrupt you with any sounds, but she'll hold up the yellow card so that you can know that you have 30 seconds left to finish up. Remember, that's a bit of time, right? That's one sixth of your total presentation. Um, it's just to give you an idea of your timing. When your time is up, Suraksha will hold up that red card same time is up, and you will say, time. The important thing is that you completely stop presenting at that point, because three minute thesis rules say you must stop when time is up or you will be disqualified. Make sense? Okay, excellent. Um, our judges today are using a rubric uh, with a couple of criteria. The first one is comprehension and content. So the presentation follow a clear and logical sequence. Um, you know, they're communicated in language that's appropriate to a non-specialist audience. Uh, and then the other criteria will be engagement and communication. So did the presenter capture and maintain the interest of the audience? Did the slide act as, as act to augment the presentation and make it more clear? Prizes will be awarded as follows. Uh, first place will receive a thousand dollar credit on their student account and funding to travel to the regional competition, which will be held in Tampa, Florida this year, and uh, will be part of the Conference of Southern Graduate Schools annual meeting. Second place will receive seven hundred fifty dollar prize. And third place will receive $500 prize. We will also have a People's Choice Award that you will all have the opportunity to vote in at the end. And while there's no cash associated with that prize, there are really major branding rights. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. See how big a rooting squad you all are. Um, any questions for the competitors? Okay. Well, I will call you up in the order of go, and I will wait for you to settle in and nod to me. And at that point, I will advance your slide, and our timer will begin. So first, we have Jana Tool Ferdo, and she is in the PhD program in bioinformatics.
and getting stronger in the day. By the time the party comes, I get really strong and infectious. So when I crash the party, I make everyone sick. And since I'm new, the old vaccinations cannot even stop me from spreading and making people suffer. Now, imagine if you are notified with a report prior to the party that said, hey, there is a new COVID variant secretly living in your building and it's getting stronger. Would you still go to the party? I assume you would not. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do in my PhD project, generating a report that can reveal the potential new COVID variant even before it is strong enough to make people sick. And to do that, all I need from you is your building's poop water. I know what you're thinking. Ew! But hey, trust me, it gets better. Even though it sounds interesting, but using the poop water to detect the potential new COVID variant is a bit more challenging in real life. Because when it is processed, most of what is found is everyone's poop with their DNA, but only a tiny little part of me, the new COVID variant's DNA. And this little part is not enough to generate that. So our plan is to take this little part and then photocopy it and keep doing that until it is enough to generate that report. This whole process is known as sequencing. The reports that are generated by sequencing can tell us what are the variants that are leading your building, if they're increasing or decreasing over time, if they're getting more or less infectious due to mutation, and most importantly, if there is a new COVID variant secretly living in your building. Now, can you imagine if we could get all this information about the new COVID variant even before it is strong enough to make people sick, how well prepared all of us and the healthcare system could be to fight it? Once again, I know what you're thinking. Wow. And that, my friend, is the journey from ew to wow. Thank you. surgery, for example, gastric bypass, that includes cutting and sealing of blood vessels inside your abdominal cavity, they would cut through your whole belly for this purpose. Then, the times changed. Now, surgeons make small incisions, like a centimeter wide on your body, and insert an instrument called a laparoscopic device to seal the vessels. What a surgeon do is, he clamps the vessel with this device and seal it using electrical energy. However, this electrical energy also thermally damages the surrounding healthy tissues as it is very difficult to focus this energy only to the concerned part of the vessel. And not only this, this energy also takes longer time to seal the vessel, consequently increasing the surgery time. Now like in the past, uh, researchers were successful to avoid the cutting of your whole belly for these types of procedures. Our lab is trying best to avoid these recent problems as well for humanity. We have recently successfully demonstrated that lasers have the ability to focus their energy only to the concerned part of the vessel and ultimately not damage the healthy tissues. And not only this, the sealing time is also less than other energy-based laparoscopic devices. Now here arises another major problem. A surgeon has to examine himself continuously to decide when the vessel is sealed so that he can turn off the laser. That's not what he wants. You guys will not also want that when there's a patient lying in front of you in a critical condition with few holes on his body. So all what he wants is just one button that he presses, laser turns on, and turns off automatically when the vessel is sealed. As researchers, we had to find some kind of indicator for this purpose, and we found fluorescence. What is it? It is the property of a substance to glow when we shine a particular light on it. Uh, you can, uh, and guess what? Our human vessels are fluorescent substance. 
You can see the presence of human vessels and arteries uh, on the bottom right of the screen uh, in greenish color on a microscale. And there is something exciting we found out that the intensity of this fluorescent light of, of human vessels increases in when, while we are sealing it with laser and it stabilizes when the vessel is sealed. That's exciting because with this approach we will develop a closed loop system that will sense that the vessel has been sealed and increase in fluorescent light is stabilized and laser will turn off automatically. You can see the vessel I sealed in my lab uh, myself. Uh, and all a surgeon has to do is to press just one button. Consequently, this research will make surgery easy, quick and safer for patients as well as surgeons. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Udomor from our civil engineering PhD program.
This alone shows that kids do see color and they're able to form a racial identity at a very young age. Building from the 1939 Ken Clark Doll study that discovered that black kindergartners had already developed a negative self-image of themselves due to their social and educational surroundings, my study uses crayons and self-portraits to explore if kids do recognize race and if racial identity significantly impacts how they see themselves or others. The participants of my study are ages six to nine years old, and they're asked to draw a picture of themselves using any crayon color they choose. While they're coloring, they're asked a few questions, such as, why did you choose this color? And does this color interact with other crayon colors? And do you feel your crayon color is seen as good? While the data of my study is still being analyzed, a pilot study was conducted, and we found the following. In the first picture, Students were asked how they thought the white crayon or the brown crayon feels about the other crayons. One participant said, the brown crayon is sad because the, they're not like the other crayons and the other crayons are treated differently. Participants were asked the same question about the second set of crayons and one participant responded, the white crayon doesn't like the other crayons because of their color. So what does this say? I'm so glad you asked. The pilot study showed that kids do see color and they're able to form a racial identity and that identity can significantly impact them. My study will provide next steps for school counselors so that they can celebrate cultural diversity with their students and also create culturally inclusive environments so that school counselors can continue going beyond kids don't see color.
apply the same process to other harmful diseases. We've been taking COVID negative tests from the Student Health Center, as well as the local medical center, and also on campus water samples to see what else could be circulated. First, we extract the genetic material from our samples. Then, we amplify it, which just means duplicating it so we have more of it to work with. Then, we want to see what exact virus or bacteria is in the sample. We do this by genetic sequencing. All we do is we take the DNA that we extracted and see what viral or bacterial DNA it matches with. We want to expand the location of our testing and tracking to be outside of just the UNCC campus. We're also building predictive models that can tell you when a disease outbreak is going to happen. We want you to know what could potentially harm you and circulating on a campus where you work or go to school and interact with others on a daily basis. Having this information available and these predictive models can help us be prepared for any disease outbreak in the future. Thank you. Yeah, it's 
interacting with you or something or someone. For instance, the chosen you all yet you all happen to be sitting in, all at a respective angle, which in turn has an effect on your posture. Understanding this macro example allows us to begin to understand what happens on a molecular level within between macromolecules. And in particular, my talk today between DNA and proteins, which can interact with one another and form protein DNA complexes and have an array of functions in the body. And my research focuses on developing a model that will more accurately determine and label these interactions, allowing us to better understand them and their impacts on our bodies. As mentioned, protein DNA complexes have an array of functions in the body, one of them more popular being gene expression regulation. And these functions are determined by their specificities, one of three types, either being highly, multi, or non-specific. And when these interactions do occur, they take one of three geometric shapes depicted from least to most favorable, stacked, T-shaped, or inclined, all determined just using one of the three plane angles. Quick and easy and simple, right? However, has been proven to be quite inaccurate, and that's where I come in. Two, reduce the act to reduce the inaccuracy and improve accuracy. Well, one might ask, how do you do this? Well, for one, instead of just using one of the plane angles, use all three, and along with the angles, use the distances that exist between the protein DNA in the center of masses and their atoms. I did this using a program my research advisor developed, running three data sets through them, and got a reporting of the parameters I just listed, and as well as a prediction of the geometry types. 312 interactions were predicted and reported, 65 of them were false positives, and 35% of them were true positives. T-shaped having the highest occurrence, followed by incline, and lastly stacked. Now with this data that I have, I'm now currently in the model development phase, and I hope with this uh, model development phase is to produce a model that will more accurately and more efficiently report this data for us and many other scientists. And in the grand scheme of things, enable and better enhance the medications that are developed to aid these protein DNA complexes, thus optimizing their functions in our body. Serology, in the study of human serum, is very closely related to immunology, in the study of the human immune system. And our lab has found an amazing link between the wastewater that we all produce every single day and serology. So, our lab already pulls wastewater samples from over 40 different sites on campus. So our antibody group thought, what if we take those same samples, run them through a cloud filtration process, and then test them for specific antibodies? Now, when I say specific antibodies, I mean same catch and hold. Your body produces specific cold antibodies to fight off that disease. Think of them like little soldiers that fight for your body. And so we're looking for the antibodies within the waste farm. And now the two most common forms of antibodies in the human body is IgG and IgA. They look different, they fight for your body in different ways, but the major difference that matters to our lab is how long they last outside the human body. Now IgG can last outside the human body for around 21 days or three weeks. And IgA can last outside the human body for around four to seven days. Now, if we look inside the wastewater for these two antibodies, we can see if we find IgG, someone that's had this specific disease within the past three weeks, maybe three days, maybe three weeks. If we find IgA, the time period is a lot shorter, four to seven days within a week, we're going to find someone who's found had that disease within the community. And so we found that the best way to measure antibody amount within communities is through an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or an elastin wave. While the name is complicated, the function is not. It's simply a series of codes within the 96 ball plate. The well itself is coated with chemical, it binds what we're looking for, and then it binds a little blue photoreceptor on top of that. And the more blue you have, the more samples is there. And this data is invaluable. We can tell what community has what disease, when, and over what time frame. And the applications are limitless. We're talking from what flu shot gets put out this year to even combating bioterrorism. And the way that we use our model on campus is upscalable. We can go from university to city to county to state and even to the nationwide level. And hopefully, with this technology and this approach, as simple as it may be, 
we can stop the next COVID-19. Thank you. How do we do it? How do you train your baby to recognize a cat and dog? 
by showing and saying it thousands of times, right? Similarly, we have trained our AI algorithm using thousands of real-world arcing and normal kernel so that the algorithm can extract the arcing features and learn from it. Once trained, the algorithm can detect arc fault at more than 99% accuracy. Now you're thinking, oh, it is an AI-based algorithm, certainly it needs a big computer to run it, right? No. Keeping that in mind, we have engineered our AI algorithm to make it very lightweight and simplify it so that it can easily fit into a small microcontroller that has very limited computing power. Yet, installing them, our algorithm can detect art fault in less than 3 milliseconds. So, say no to electric art fault and electric fire hazards. Using our AI-based art fault protection system, we can not only deliver safe and reliable electricity, but can save thousands of invaluable lives. Thank you. Jay Takakua from the Masters in Bioinformatics program.
<laughs> so for the People's Choice Award, that one goes to Genital Pedros. <laughs> goes to Jade Takakua. <laughs> Second place, which comes with a $750 award, goes to Brittany Glover. <laughs> Drum roll for first place, which comes with a thousand dollar award, and this person will go with us to the Council of Southern Graduate Schools in March to compete in the next round, and that one goes to Louis Alexander. <laughs> 